Oh. Okay, nice to nice to see everybody, or or nice. So many. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm supposed to say a bit about myself for those who don't know anything about me. Uh, I spent most of my career uh, in Cambridge, uh, teaching at uh, Anglia Ruskin University, teaching chemistry. Uh, I also taught in secondary school and as a community college in California for a year. Uh, I've always been interested in the history of chemistry and when we launched a chemistry degree at Anglia, I put up a module uh, for, in the history of chemistry uh, and it was quite popular, but I felt there wasn't a really satisfactory course text. So I wrote one which was published by Macmillan and was also published in the States and actually did quite well. Um, I also have done um, some research projects. Uh, the biggest one I did was in the role that uh, chemists uh, played in the early history of the railway industry in this country in the 19th century. And that was the uh, basis of another book I wrote with, with Colin Russell. Uh, I've been uh, involved in the historical group of the Royal Society of Chemistry for a long time. Uh, and I've served as the ordinary committee member, treasurer, uh, chairman, the immediate, uh, immediate past chairman, uh, preceding Peter Morris, and I'm now back to the status of an ordinary committee member, and like many people on committees, I'm going to try and get out of it fairly soon, but don't tell Peter that. Um, so uh, that's more or less um, about me. I've been retired 20 years now. I live in, I moved up to Lake District, um, and I spend my time uh, renovating my old property. Uh, and uh, I do a bit of history of chemistry still, a bit of local history. Uh, I've researched uh, a company in Carlisle that uh, made, uh, made um, dyes during the First World War and subsequently became a big, big component of ICI. Um, uh, so I'm, I, I do historical bits of research, particularly those with a, with a Cumbrian connection. So that's me. And uh, when uh, when everybody signed in, I'm ready to go. Okay, thank you very much, John. And we now have 74 people, so that's it. Thank you very much. I'm very yeah. sorry I didn't send out the um, first email to the second batch of people. Uh, somehow I got overlooked, and then uh, this morning I had terrible, terrible problems with my email. But remember, you got this strange email from HCAS meeting secretary, for which I also apologise, but at least at the end of the day, you got the link, and indeed, we've now got 75 people, so that's even better. Um, I'm going to try in future to stop using two batteries. It's a problem with my email system, but I'll see what I can do. However, we're not here today to hear about me even moaning about my email system. No, we're here today to hear John Hodgson talking about the search for gold, and particularly alchemy. John, over to you. Please, so I, please. I, share, I share my screen, do I? Yeah. Share my screen. I hope so, John. Haven't seen it yet. Ah, excellent. It's starting. Right, okay. Wait a minute. There we are. Slideshow. Can you put on, can you put on oh, slideshow? Oh, here we go. Okay. Very good. Oh, John Fring wants to admit it. I admit him. Admit. Okay. Okay. Off you go. Okay, right, good. Um, well, alchemy, as you I'm sure know, is popularly remembered as the attempt to make gold by chemical means, although it encompasses other chemical operations as well. And what I'm going to do in hopefully not much more than 45 minutes is give examples of some of the things the alchemists actually did. I'm going to ask what, if anything, they achieved. And I'm going to ask if modern chemistry owes anything at all to the alchemists. I think interest in alchemy has increased in recent years, to some extent at least. And I think there are two, I can think of several reasons for this, but here are two reasons. Firstly, uh, I'll admit someone else. Firstly, uh, this, these books in the, uh, well, well over 20 years ago now, um, the first Harry Potter book uh, referred to the evil Voldemort who was trying to obtain the Philosopher's Stone. 
The Philosopher's Stone was, of course, the magic substance that alchemists tried to find that would enable them to make gold. It was often reckoned to be a red or purple powder rather than a hard stone itself. I'm admitting people all the time, um, Peter. Um, so interest in alchemy increased because of, I think, because of the Harry Potter books. But perhaps a more academic reason was uh, this gentleman here, Lawrence Pankipi. Uh, he is or was Professor of Organic Chemistry at Johns Hopkins University of Baltimore, United States. And a long time ago now, he started to interpret alchemical texts and he attempted to, to recreate some of the processes. Obviously, he didn't make gold, but he found that some of the things that the alchemists said would happen, did happen. And I will be referring to uh, Principi's work uh, uh, on several occasions through this presentation. Um, some of those who called themselves alchemists were, I think, rational scientists. But many were motivated by greed, either working for themselves or sponsored by others. Some were just fraudsters or tricksters, and some, in blind faith, ruined themselves. But in studying the history of science, I think a great mistake you can make is to judge the past from the standpoint of the present. The main ancient theory of chemical change predicted that the synthesis of gold was a possibility. So what was the theoretical underpinning of alchemy? Well, the most important one was due to this gentleman here, Aristotle, uh, who lived from uh, 384 to 322 BCE. Uh, so we're talking about 2,300 years ago. And uh, his theory was that all materials consist of primary matter encrusted form. And the simplest combination of matter and form were the four elements, which were earth, air, fire, and water. Um, and in principle, one element could be turned into another by the addition or removal of the appropriate qualities, hot, dry, cold, and wet. So these are the processes of um, dissolving or heating or drying and so on. It's a very simple theory, but in principle, it, it, it showed that or, or predicted that anything could be turned into anything else. They didn't know what the rules of the game were as we do today. But when you think about it, this is a, a piece of mineral. This is um, this is uh, this is malachite, um, and of course that's basic copper carbonate. And wait a minute, is I getting some about a waiting room, Peter? And. As you know, it's basic copper carbonate, and of course it's an ore of copper. And I like to think that it must have been a very long time ago, well before Aristotle, um, there was uh, Stone Age people were sitting around the firing, and uh, and uh, the charcoal in the fire caused the uh, uh, extraction of copper to occur. Perhaps a little girl. I'd seen a pretty stone in the fire in the night before. In the morning, she went out to see if it was still there. It wasn't there, but it was a black mass. She scratched around and it was a tiny bit of copper. Pure speculation. But whoever developed that, whoever made those observations and developed it in the process was a pretty good scientist in the stone age. Um, just excuse me. There. Can you go around the other side? Sorry, folks. Delivery come. Um, so where was I? Uh, and of course, the, if you can make copper from a from a, a stone like that, um, the, the theory arose in, as alchemy progressed that um, metals, uh, stones could turn into metals in the earth very slowly, and those metals could slowly in turn turn into gold, which was the absolute climax. It was the, it was the most noble metal. It didn't corrode, and it was very pretty. So if you turn this stone into copper, 
then all you've got to do is add the color and add the uh, uh, resistance to corrosion and you're there. It wasn't a stupid idea all that long time ago. So let's look at the phases of alchemy. And here are the main phases of alchemy. Uh, Alexandrian al alchemy in Egypt, uh, Islamic alchemy and European alchemy. There was also Chinese alchemy, which had some influence probably on Islamic alchemy uh, down the Silk Road, uh, which stretched from China to the Middle, the Middle East. The particular idea that might have come from China that influenced Islamic alchemy was the, the fact that gold might uh, convey uh, immortality to humans. And this was the medical aspect of it. The Chinese thought it was probably a good idea to eat off uh, golden plates, especially if it was alchemical gold, or somehow incorporate gold into medicines. That might have had some influence on Islamic alchemy. Alchemy certainly had a sort of uh, achieved a kind of medical term um, uh, from about this, this period here. I'm going to look at these phases very, very briefly. I'm mainly going to concentrate on European alchemy, which had the most influence, obviously direct influence, uh, on contemporary chemistry. Uh, so let's uh, go back to ancient Egypt. Now, this is a long time before uh, the Alexandrian period of alchemy. Tutankhamun lived, of course, uh, around 1300 BC. But nevertheless, the Egyptian craftsmen uh, had were expert at making gold articles, expert in working with gold, but also expert in giving other materials the appearance of gold. Uh, they were able to uh, uh, tinge the surface of metals to make them look very, very realistic. And uh, the Alexandrian alchemists learn from the Egyptian craftsmen and try to uh, further improve and perfect these processes. Now, one particular, we, we have very, very little in the way of documentary evidence of what the Alexandrian alchemists did uh, about between 100 and uh, 700 AD. But uh, there are two papyri uh, which exist, the Leiden papyrus and the Stockholm papyrus, uh, named after the cities in Europe where they are now kept. And this is a recipe from the Leiden papyrus, which uh, should give you an, uh, a, a liquid, which when applied to a metal surface, particularly a uh, silver surface, gives it the appearance of gold. Now at this stage, I of course, obviously have done a risk assessment before I give this presentation. And this is the health and safety warning. You must not go to your kitchens and try this. But you put lime and salt in the vessel, you add the urine of youth, you uh, heat it up, and the liquid will look like blood, you filter it off from the sediments, and you use it pure. You apply it to the surface of the silver article. Well, pre-kid and try this. And this is what happened. Now, this is a very poor photograph. It's actually scanned, it looks like this in his book. Um, and there's a Canadian silver dollar on the left and uh, what it looks like uh, when, um, when it's been treated with the, with the, with the uh, liquid from that process. And you can see that, so, so on the left, the silver dollar looks blue, but that's the photography. Um, on the right is what it looks like when it's been treated with the liquid from that process. And it's pretty realistic. And that gold looking surface is pretty durable. It's a, it's a layer of calcium polysulfides, chemically, that's what it is. But, you know, uh, they haven't given this, the color of gold all through it, but obviously they must have thought they were, you know, a little bit farther down the line. The only other thing I'm going to say about Alexandria alchemy is some of the apparatus they developed. Now, this is a, uh, a picture from uh, a, a, a document in the Library of St. Mark's in Venice, and it's been copied over the ages many, many times because uh, these things, of course, decay over time. You're talking about hundreds of years. Uh, they have to be recopied. And my guess is that the, the, the guys who made this copy didn't quite understand what they were copying. 
There are obviously distillation apparatus up there, these two on the left. Um, this is a, a stove of some sort. Uh, this is a condensing hood. The liquid's supposed to run down here. I think these little bobbles here are, um, my guess is they're accidents. They're not, they're, they're not really supposed to be there, but these guys didn't really know what they were copying. If we move on to the Islamic period, we do actually have a survivor of an Islamic distillation apparatus. It's much squatter than what I've just shown, but you can see that uh, the similarity, uh, and this is the condensing hood, this would be on a stove. This is a bit like, you know, you, you heat your, you boil your potatoes and you lift the lid and there's water, water condensed underneath. Well, the uh, volatile liquid would condense on, on the inside of this cover. It would run down to this kind of gutter and then it would go down the tube to the collecting vessel. So they were, and, and the alchemists of this period invented, used many uh, simple laboratory techniques we still use today. A lot of the stuff that we used to do in, 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 the, in the chemistry labs when we were at school, that kind of stuff. Um, the, I mentioned that the Islamic alchemists uh, uh, were, were often medical people as well. They were often, they were often doctors uh, trying to cure people. Uh, a famous doctor called Al-Razi in the West, we tend to call him, in Europe, we tend to call him Razi. Al-Razi was his name. He classified uh, substances uh, according to properties, uh, the properties they exhibited. And you can see that there are some quite sensible classifications here of volatile materials, of metals, of well, vitriols, I presume, will be uh, substances that, that form glass like crystals and so on, salts here. These are quite sensible classifications. And don't forget that. This is what chemists do today. We classify things uh, into groups of uh, uh, materials with similar properties, uh, whether they're groups of the periodic tables, whether they're, um, whether they're members of a homologous series. Uh, and we believe rightly that, um, they, uh, that, that they have uh, some kind of similar similarity in their make, makeup or constitution. Uh, so this guy is beginning to think chemically. So now on to Europe, which is the main focus of my talk. Uh, and what's something that crept into, uh, into uh, alchemy uh, in the European period was uh, really almost a bit of astrology at, at times. Um, the seven metals known were thought to be related to the seven planets. They thought the sun and moon were planets in those days. And these symbols for the planets uh, also uh, came to have the symbols for the metals as well in our chemical literature. And in some alchemical literature, there is the belief that you should um, do certain, uh, attempt certain operations uh, at certain um, phases of the moon or, or whatever. But the point is that uh, uh, what, what, what happened was that um, from the middle, middle of the 12th century, Arabic chemical and medical texts became translated into Latin and became available to European scholars. And so uh, the Europeans started uh, their own uh, alchemical experimentation. Uh, the, the Islamic world and the Christian world of light met in Spain, of course, and also, and also in North, much further east. Um, yeah, and the, uh, Muslim armies got to the gates of Vienna at one time, uh, and whilst there was conflict, there was also a uh, transfer of information as well. So what did the European alchemists do? Well, they uh, continued to improve the apparatus. This is another distillation apparatus. You can see its relationship to uh, what had been developed in Alexandria. The stove like a, this looked like an air bath type thing. We've got a condensing apparatus here, uh, and uh, you could have water in this. Uh, and some of them had uh, water going in the top and a tap at the bottom, so you could change the water. Uh, there's one of these actually, if you're ever in Spain, uh, a place called Ronda, there's uh, one outside the, the, the door of a museum there, and it's huge. This thing's like a, it's, it's like a massive dustbin. It's not, it's not a piece of 
bench apparatus. It, it's this is for distilling on a grand scale, and with the uh, ability to distil, distil, they could uh, make reasonably pure alcohol. Uh, they could isolate mineral acids. Um, so uh, new materials were being produced. By other techniques, the alchemists or well, an alchemist called Henry Brand, much later in, um, in the 17th century, I think it was actually uh, isolated phosphorus. It was the only element actually isolated by a by by an alchemist. So we're getting we're getting new apparatus. Uh, one I mentioned one particular um, alchemist or who had a big influence. Uh, he had, uh, also was, was a, a medical man, a doctor who was called Paracelsus, and he, um, he developed a new theory of matter that uh, uh, all matter was consisted of, consisted of three principles, which were the philosophical essences of sulfur, mercury, and salt. They were not sulfur, mercury, and salt quite as we know them, uh, uh, and uh, that was his theory of, um, of, uh, of composition. But he, I'm still missing people all the time. Um, can you admit them, Peter? I'm missing people all the time. It's a bit distracting. Never mind. Um, he, he, he was a, a, a medical man, he, uh, and uh, he uh, started to make chemical as opposed to herbal medicines. He started to use his alchemical procedures to make medicines and he was using metals like mercury and antimony and arsenic in his medicines all of which of course are poisonous but uh, in, in small doses uh, of course they can have a beneficial effect and it was about this time John, 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 John could I just hold you a moment people, people are saying they can't hear you very well is there some way that you can sort of bring yourself closer to the microphone or somehow improve the quality. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any problem at this end. I think the problem is perhaps it partly a bandwidth issue. Sorry okay, about is that this. a bit better? That is a bit better, yeah. Is that a bit better? It is a bit better, yeah. Uh, I think, I think also, that's the best I can do. Yeah, perhaps also speak a little bit more okay. slowly. Perhaps speak a, bit, a little bit more slowly as well might help. Okay. But people okay, are, okay. People are saying people are saying it is better. Yes. I mean I would say to okay, people good, good. maybe it might be worth Yeah, okay. Um, I, think I can't hear you now. No, that's fine, yes, okay. Try that. I'm going offline again. What is what is happening? That's what, okay. What, uh, okay. Well what is happening, that's Peter, is I'm having to admit people all, all the time. No, 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 I, I, I take care of that. I take care of that, John. It's just because you're a co-host. But ignore that. I'm dealing with that. Okay. Okay. So I'll leave that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So that's Paracelsus. He. I didn't give his dates. He lived from 1493, 1541. So we're moving into the 16th century now. Um, okay. Uh, so what did the alchemists? What did the European alchemists actually do? Now, one of the materials they they used a great deal was stibnite, which is antimony sulfide. Stibnite is antimony sulfide, the main ore of antimony. It was much used in alchemical procedures. And this is a procedure for a medicine, uh, which was uh, supposed to make you feel better if you were a bit a bit down in the dumps, if you had a headache or you weren't very well for some reason. And you started with stignite, which of course, in modern terms, is sulfur of antimony anyway, but we won't worry about that. You roasted the stignite, turned it into an ash, you heated very strongly, and uh, you got a, 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 a liquid which you poured out and it solidified into a golden glass. You then extracted the vinegar, you evaporated to a gummy residue, and you uh, extracted with alcohol, 
you've got a sweet red oil, which they call sulfur of antimony, and it was supposed to make you feel better. Well, Crinkippi tried this. He got his stibnite. He uh, heated it, uh, uh, roasted it to ash. He fused it, heated it strongly, and tipped it out, and all he got was a grey grot. He didn't get a golden glass. But then he looked at the recipe very carefully and saw that, that the alchemist had used stibnite from a particular mine in Hungary, or what is modern day Hungary. So he got some of that stibnite and he proceeded, he roasted it, he fused the ash, he tipped it out and this is what he saw. A beautiful golden glass, exactly as the alchemist had said. So what had happened here? Uh, I guess that this uh, stibnite from Hungary has got a fair bit of circle or quartz in it and therefore it's got enough to make a glass and, uh, and that's how he gets the glass. So, uh, emboldened by that success, uh, Prinkipi proceeded with the recipe. Uh, he, and as the, uh, as the uh, recipe said, he, uh, he extracted the glass of vinegar, he crushed it up, but the recipe actually said, you use a, 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 an iron vessel for this and you crush it up with an iron rod. So he did that. Um, that's how he did the extraction of vinegar. He poured the vinegar extract off, evaporated, extracted alcohol. He needed to get a sweet red oil, uh, which would, and which was actually, of course, ferrous aspate iron to ethanol. Uh, now that, of course, would work as a medicine uh, if you were uh, you know just had a cold or a headache and a lot of people take a tot of whiskey in such situations uh, if you were anemic short of iron that would do you good um, of course if any antimony had gone through all the way through uh, then it might have killed you but um, it was it was the point was it was a valid recipe it wasn't the uh, Mumbo jumbo that you might dismiss it as being out of hand without thinking about it. So um, let's go on to uh, some actual texts involving gold making. And a lot of these old texts are extremely hard to understand. Uh, they uh, are often pictorial, uh, sometimes with a brief commentary uh, accompanying the pictures. Now this is a well-known process for purifying gold. Gold itself was often needed in our chemical processes. Alchemy was so, sometimes called multiplication of gold. You needed gold to get more gold. So what this is all about is, well, first of all, the, the commentary is it says, the gray wolf devours the king, after which it is burned on a pyre, consuming the wolf and restoring the king to life. Now this is the gray wolf is the symbol in alchemical documentation for stibnite, antimony sulfonite. The king is the symbol for gold. So this is your impure gold. It is being fused with stibnite. So what will happen is if there are any other metals in the gold, their sulfides will be made and free antimony will be released. If you then heat it on the pyre, antimony is volatile. Heat it strongly, it, the antimony disappears and you are left with purer gold than you started with. Here is the purified king. So again, this appears to be complete nonsense on first sight, but um, there is, it is actually uh, referring to a valid process for purification of gold. Okay, so what about attempts to make the philosopher's stone 
and hence attempt to make gold, attempts to make gold itself. There are lots of different texts, many of them pictorial, uh, and sometimes with brief commentaries. Uh, and one of the most famous texts, which is which was um, copied out many, many times, is called the Twelve Keys of Basil Valentine. Basil Valentine was almost certainly a mixture of alchemists, as it were, and this is a kind of um, condensation, as it were, of uh, what he was, was, was saying, his 12 texts. And this is, uh, each one has, or 12 keys, rather, sorry. This is the first key of Basil Valentine, and this refers to a valid process. Uh, what he is talking about is making pure gold and pure silver, uh, which uh, in this process we need both of those. And this is the method of purifying gold I've just referred to. Here's your grey wolf. This is the crucible um, uh, for the uh, procedure. This is turning impure gold into pure gold that you need. This is turning impure silver into the pure silver that you need. It refers to the cupellation process, which was a way of uh, purifying uh, silver from lead. Uh, most silver had lead in it because it was uh, obtained from lead ore. Um, and what you did, you heated it in the crucible. The lead was converted to lead oxide, which was absorbed by the material of the crucible, and then you got pure silver. The old man here is still playing, playing a non-existent cello, refers to is a symbol for Saturn, and Saturn was the symbol for lead. Uh, and often depicted by an old man who's slow, and of course Saturn, the planet, moves very slowly. On to the next key, which is a fight between, uh, between two contestants. Uh, the one with the, um, with the dragon is uh, potassium nitrate, uh, sort of piece of The one with the eagle is um, uh, ammonium chloride, sal ammonia. You heat them together and you get uh, a distillate of aqua regia which of course is the solvent for gold and silver. We've got gold here and silver. Uh, the referee seems to be, seems to have lost his football shorts, I'm not quite sure. There's a lot of weird imagery here, but that's undoubtedly what, uh, what this refers to. It's a valid process for making aqua region. If we now skip to the 12th key, uh, this is what um, you would do uh, if you've got the Philosopher's Stone. Um, the dragon here, or the, the lion, whichever it's supposed to be, is, uh, is gold, devouring the snake, which is the stone. And when you've got that, when they're heated with a base metal, the whole lot should turn into gold. That was what they thought they would do if they got all the way through the 12 keys. But of course, the question arises is, what were the keys in the middle? And this is the eighth key. And this is, the meaning of this is completely obscure. Of course, um, the, these middle keys, whatever they were supposed to refer to, it wouldn't have worked and you wouldn't have got the Philosopher's Stone. So Principi thinks that the early keys refer to real laboratory experience. The middle ones like this refer to predictive processes which we can't now unravel on the basis of current theories. And the final key is the expected procedure once the stone had been made. That procedure where you made solutions of gold and silver was called making the stone in the wet way. There was also a dry way of making the stone. And the first stage of that was to uh, make philosophical mercury, amalgamate it with gold, heat it in an egg-shaped vessel, uh, and leave it 
uh, at the appropriate, appropriate degree of heat temperature, of course, they didn't have uh, and it would turn into the philosopher's tree, which was a beautiful, shining, sparkling silver tree. Well, Lawrence Crinkley, he tried it. Uh, he made some philosophical mercury following a procedure he found in our chemical text. It took him a long time and it didn't seem much different from the mercury he started with, according to him. He amalgamated it with gold. He put it in a egg-shaped vessel, the, the best he had in his laboratory, corked it up, heated it on the sand bath, and for, not, for, for days and days, and absolutely nothing happened. And then one morning he came into his laboratory and this is what he saw a mass of bright silvery growth a silvery growth a tree exactly as the alchemist had said um he said the egg he, this was his this was his attempt at an egg his this vessel this was his, his flask he had um for several weeks i varied the heat uh, since the texts don't give a clear indication of temperature use. Uh, the little mixture did a little more during this time and swell lightly, increasing fluidity and become partly covered with warty excrescences. Um, and then he went into the lab, I'm putting his book there, I arrived at the laboratory one morning to discover that the mixture had taken on a completely new and an extraordinary surprise in appearance overnight. Only a grey morphous mass lay at the bottom of the flask the day before, while a glittering and fully formed tree filled the vessel on the following morning. My first reaction to the sight was utter disbelief. Then, after becoming relatively certain I had not taken leave of my senses, a sense of awe and wonder came in. Imagine how the alchemist had thought. After trying and trying, he had uh, succeeded in this rather wonderful first step. And uh, uh, Prinkinski concludes this paragraph by saying, for the historian, the reality of this philosophical truth indicates unambiguously that at least some of the imagery of alchemy, bizarre as it might seem, stems from the literal appearance of reacting chemicals. So, some of the things that did happen, and uh, we thank Principi and the work he's done uh, to show that uh, there was some truth, particularly in the early stages. Let's quickly go on to looking at what the alchemists' workshops, uh, laboratories workshops, actually looked like. And at the end of the European period, we do have some paintings of alchemists' workshops, particularly from Holland, from it was the Dutch golden era in the 17th century. And uh, uh, the Dutch genre painters uh, were painting all sorts of aspects of daily life, and they painted images of uh, alchemical workshops. And this is one, this is um, a famous one. Uh, by a painter called Van Estada, 17th century. Alchemists were often called puffers because they were puffing away at bellows to get the uh, highest temperature they could. But you see all the sort of clutter around about. Um, and notice the book. He's got a, this isn't, this isn't an Aristotelian type book. This is a book written by an earlier alchemist uh, who would have claimed he knew how to make the stone. And this chap, is trying to trying to uh, copy it. See a distillation apparatus here. Um, this is next one is by the same guy, and this rather than our starter. And it's quite obvious that his crucible is broken, or he's knocked it over, or something, and uh, the experiment is ruined. You can almost hear him swearing uh, when uh, when this happens. Uh, this is one by a uh, in 1687 from um, a painter called Hirschhoff, is called The Alchemist's Experiment Takes Fire. And he's obviously been, there again is the book, notice the book, he's trying to copy an ancient pictorial recipe. Uh, he's obviously been heating something in a closed vessel and it's exploded. Uh, uh, but what I 
what I like about what, what I think is the human touch here almost is that this is either his servant or his wife changing the baby. She's not rushing up to see if he's all right or if he's hurt himself. Uh, she can imagine her thinking, oh, the old fool's blowing himself up again. This is a painting by uh, another Dutch painter called Jan Steen, again 17th century, uh, and it's called The Last Coin. This is the would-be alchemist committing a coin to the crucible. Uh, he's obviously, his family, he and his family are facing ruin. With all the money he spent trying to uh, achieve this uh, conversion. Here are the money lenders in the background working out how much he owes them. Uh, this guy is obviously ruining himself in a futile attempt. I mentioned that some alchemists, uh, uh, or sorry, some uh, aristocrats sponsored alchemists. They gave them grants, if you like, to uh, discover the secret and confide it to their patrons and hopefully make their already wealthy patrons even, even richer. Uh, and this is the Golden Lane in Prague, it's called the Golden Lane. I've not been there, I've got this from a book, but these are all supposed to be alchemists workshops. There was a lane, a, a lane to be in, in Prague. Uh, but of course, trying to be an alchemist, particularly if you were sponsored by a wealthy patron, was a very high risk occupation. This guy is called Georg Honor, and he was sponsored by Duke Friedrich of Württemberg. And I think he, like many alchemists, uh, duped the patron by uh, performing uh, an experiment that appeared to make gold, but of course was a, a, a fraudulent trick. I don't know what he did, but a, a favourite one was to uh, make, if you like, a charcoal briquette by um, by taking charcoal dust and specks of gold, rolling them together with some kind of glue or gum that would stick them all together, and uh, then rolling the whole thing in the end with just charcoal dust itself, so it looked like a piece of charcoal. You made a whole load of these put them in a big cauldron of some sort, and you put other materials in that would all um, evaporate or burn away when the cauldron was put uh, on, the, on the stove. Um, and so after the heating process, everything had evaporated or burned away apart from the gold, and in the bottom of the cauldron was a tiny, a tiny piece of gold. Uh, now this chap, now, net a sticky end, as indeed quite a few alchemists did. Um, he convinced uh, Duke Frederick that uh, he could make gold. Duke Frederick said, right, he dumped, or got his, 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 his servants to dump two tons of bar iron outside the this chap's workshop uh, and said he wanted that turned into gold by next week. And uh, of course, this chap Honorar failed, so the uh, Duke Frederick had the, had the iron bars strapped together in the form of a gallows. He had the gallows uh, gold plated and he hanged this uh, unfortunate uh, fraudulent alchemist from the, from the golden gallows. Uh, some alchemists were subjected to horrible tortures when they failed. It was, it was very much a high risk game. Anyway, we're in the 17th century, moving towards the 18th century, we're in the 17th century for the moment, and new ideas were beginning to emerge. Uh, uh, new thinkers were coming along who were not reliant on the old texts of Aristotle. Uh, some of the new, first new ideas were astronomical ones, Copernicus and Galileo, both maintained that the Earth was not the center of the universe, as Aristotle had said, but everything was revolved around the sun. Of course, the opposition was from the Catholic Church, who supported the teachings of Aristotle, and they believed that God had put Earth at the center of everything. Galileo famously came into, contact, into conflict with the Roman Catholic 
church. It wasn't just astronomical ideas. It was uh, things like uh, William Harvey uh, showed that the blood uh, circulated in the body. It wasn't just pulsating and so on. But, and, and so as a result of this sort of new era of thinking, one of the things that happened in Britain or in England was the Royal Society was formed in 1660. And uh, you see its motto is here, nullius in verba. I think that presumably means um, nothing in words. It's a text, it's a quote from the Roman poet Horace. Uh, but basically what it means is, it's like take nobody's word for it. Don't take Aristotle's word for it. Do experiments, make observations, and draw your own conclusions. And in the early days of Royal Society, uh, they had uh, they had a curator of experiments. Robert Hooke was, I think, the first one. A very much underrated scientist, Robert Hooke, I think. He used to do experiments every week, sometimes twice a week, to um, ascertain, uh, to, to find out knowledge about anything in the natural world. This was the new spirit of, of inquiry. Uh, but when it came to alchemy or chemistry, it was a more difficult task really. Um, Galileo and so, so on forth, so forth were, were aided by the new telescopes. Um, but you couldn't see what was going on in your flask. You couldn't see what the um, substances were doing, how they were interacting with each other. The rules of the game of chemistry uh, were very difficult to unravel. And this is Robert Boyle, uh, who was aided in his experiments by Robert Hooke, and he looked into um, alchemical type procedures uh, with an open mind. Of course he didn't make any gold, and uh, he published uh, a book, which is a famous book, but difficult to read today, called The Skeptical Chemist. But the title says it all. Doubts and paradoxes, blah, 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 as they won't be proposed and defended by the generality of the alchemists. He's basically saying that what the alchemists saying uh, should happen, doesn't happen. Uh, but he couldn't work out what the rules of the game, game was, were. Um, and he actually says here, whereunto is promised to pass another discourse relating to the same subject, hopefully when he's uh, got some more, got some more information. Uh, so he's casting doubt upon what the alchemists say, but unable to, to put in its place a, uh, a, the a theory of chemistry. While we're in passing, we might look at another gentleman who uh, did a lot of alchemical experimentation with Isaac Newton, uh, famous of course for his work in uh, mathematics and, and, and physics, uh, but he, uh, he had an alchemical laboratory uh, in Trinity College, Cambridge, which somewhere, is somewhere here on the against the chapel wall, kind of a little lean-to shed. Um, some, some of the prints show it, but unfortunately this one doesn't. Um, but that's where it was situated. Um, and he's, Newton spent a long time copying out old alchemical texts and trying to work out what they meant and what you should do. And you can see some of the ancient symbols for uh, the metals here and so on. But of course, he too uh, was unsuccessful. But like Boyle, he didn't, uh, of course, claim to have made any gold. If we now move on to the 18th uh, century, well, Newton died in the 1727, but we move a bit later in the 18th century. Um, this is the last painting I shall show from a Dutch artist, it's by Jan Steen, and um, it's called The Village Chemist. And it's quite different from the alchemist workshops. Um, he was a village chemist, perhaps the forerunner of the modern day pharmacist, I suppose. This is supposed to, this is a servant of an aristocrat who's presented a, a uh, a formula for medicine or a formula for medicine has been written out perhaps by the, the chemist. Here are the laboratory assistants in the background, distillation making up the, the prescriptions that have been brought in or this guy has prepared. We don't know exactly what the procedure is. But this is uh, 
this gone are the days of scratching around trying to make gold here. Uh, chemistry is emerging as a separate and valuable uh, science in its own right. Um, times were changing. Increasingly, chemists were making pharmaceuticals like this, pigments, dyes, cosmetics, glasses, and so on. Um, they were making chemicals requiring, required for um, the new industries as the Industrial Revolution got going. They were making acids and alkalis and other chemicals. Chemists started being employed by industrial concerns. Josiah Wedgwood, from whom I've done some work and done presentations on, uh, he uh, did chemical experimentation himself. And when his company was, was very big, big and he was very busy, he employed a chemist, Alexander Chisholm, to do the experiments for him. And uh, his experiment books are still preserved in the in the uh, Wedgwood Museum in Barlaston, as are all his samples of various um, bodies, various, various experiments, bodies, glazes, colours, and so on um, that, 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 that he produced. So um, chemistry was beginning to do things. Alchemy was still failing. But alchemy was still not theoretically impossible. There was not a theory that told you what you could do and what you couldn't do. And at the end of the uh, 18th century, uh, the new ideas in chemistry began to emerge. And one of course, you're all familiar with this, uh, this painting, one of the principal players was Lavoisier in France. Uh, and he, uh, I haven't mentioned the phlogiston theory because it didn't have much input into alchemy, but he overthrew the phlogiston theory um, and uh, he gave a new definition of elements. An element was a material that could not be broken down into anything simpler. And this is his table of elements from his famous uh, treaté. Uh, it's got stuff, it's got light and heat up here, which wouldn't recognize, recognize elements, of course, but he's got uh, elements down here, uh, which he knew were compounds but hadn't yet been decomposed. But uh, all the way down here, he's got, he's got um, elements we would some of many recognize, and gold, of course, is here. Gold is an element. That hasn't, of course, in itself uh, finished, made alchemy uh, theoretically impossible. But then, about 20 years later, along comes John Dalton in this country, who, uh, if you like, apply, started with Dalton's, uh, with um, Lavoisier's theory and added to it, if you like, or combined it with the ancient Greek idea of an atom. Uh, I haven't mentioned atoms so far. There wasn't much atomic speculation as far as alchemy was concerned. But the idea of the uncuttable particle, the atom, atom, of course, means uncuttable, uh, was uh, there in Greek science. And Dalton said, well, every element has its own unique kind of atom. That atom cannot be split. It cannot be made. Uh, and all chemical change is explained by atoms uh, combining in different combinations to make what he called compound atoms. He didn't call them molecules. This is carbon dioxide or carbonic acid gas, as he called it, um, with a carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Um, grooving on quickly, uh, perhaps one should just say that, of course, um, Though that was 1803, um, Dalton's theory, it was 1803, let's just go back, that was Dalton's theory in 1803. It's not true to say, as some sort of A-level textbooks say, okay, then it was all sorted out. No, it wasn't, because these atoms were hypothetical. You couldn't observe them in 1803. Uh, remember, Milius in Virgo, um, only what you can see and experiment on can you really believe in. Uh, of course, now we can image atoms, but that was a long time before that came. Slowly during the 19th century, the usefulness of this theory became so obvious that most chemists uh, adopted it. It certainly wasn't universally accepted in the early years of the 19th century. 
But anyway, um, we now move on to um, the, uh, this gentleman. Uh, we're into the 20th century now, Linus Rutherford. And of course, he uh, explained radioactive decomposition. He explained the uh, radio elements were breaking up, the atoms were breaking out. Those atoms were not indestructible. Um, and he reported the first artificial transmutation in about 1919. He uh, beamed alpha particles into nitrogen and uh, and the proton was not off and an option atom was made. So he had achieved the transmutation. Uh, and he uh, continued with this work. And just before he died, he uh, gave a famous lecture in Cambridge in 1936 called and he called it the New Alchemy, it was published in 1937. But he didn't make gold. Making gold is much more difficult, there's much heavier atoms. Uh, you've got to really hit something very hard with, 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 with particles. And this was achieved in 1980 by Seaborg at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, he accelerated beams of carbon and neon nuclei at a target of bismuth and stripped off four protons and between six and 15 neutrons and created a mixture of gold isotopes in very, very small quantity. He estimated that to produce gold by this method, you would need, uh, it would cost one quadrillion dollars. It's 10 to the power of $15 at 1980 prices. Um, and furthermore, most of the gold atoms were unstable. He had a big mixture of isotopes. There's only one stable isotope, gold, 197 and some of the others have very, very short half lives. So making gold has been done. Uh, the subtitle of my talk is how to make gold. Well, you now know how to do it. Um, but you might um, bankrupt the planet in, in, in achieving it and your goal would disappear fairly quickly. Um, that, of course, doesn't stop people having a go. And of course, there are crackpots who will try and make gold. Uh, this is a Frenchman who's got himself some quick fit. I have no idea what he's doing, what his uh, solutions are. The alchemist did believe that early morning dew was, was sort of somehow magical. He's probably experimenting with that, um, but uh, he obviously would have achieved nothing. But I, I am told, and I have not looked because I think it's a waste of time, uh, that if you look on the web, you can find recipes of how to make gold in your kitchen. Uh, but it doesn't seem to have been successful, of course. Um, just one couple of quick pictures. This is interesting in the sense that this uh, presumably Muslim gentleman, I don't know, is uh, doing distillation, continuing to make illicit alcohol. Uh, but the interesting thing is that he's using uh, distillation apparatus, which shows clearly the link back to the apparatus that was developed by being um, uh, by alchemists in Alexandria West Park 2,000 years ago. But I think you can say that contemporary chemists are to some extent working in the traditional alchemists. We take existing materials and make them into different materials, make them into new materials, but not gold. And the alchemists made some new materials, uh, which they gave to chemistry, including phosphorus, they introduced some lab techniques we still use. Uh, and our, so that we do have, I think, we, we, do, we are the inheritors, we do all alchemy and alchemists to some extent. And it's nice to see that this is recognized in our coat of arms of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, and of course, there are chemical references here to the, the, the chart recorded traces of maps in front of there. You can't really see this is benzene, of course, the hexagonal ring. And you've got round six of the planetary symbols the moon for silver, going around clockwise, Venus, copper, Jupiter, tin, Saturn, lead, Mars, iron, and ending up. You've got Mercury, well, you can work out what that stands for. But what have you got in the middle? The sun, the ancient alchemical symbol for gold. So I hope I've convinced you of a number of things, principally that modern chemistry does to some extent owe something to alchemy, but we should always realize and remember that by the theories of the time, what the alchemists were attempting to achieve was not impossible. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, John. And that was an excellent talk taking up from the Egyptian pharaoh right up to the RST today. So an, <laughs> an incredible span of history. I've got, uh, I think we've got just one question here. Um, and that is that one that I wondered about myself, actually, which is um, that coin, that Canadian coin you showed near the beginning. I think it was probably a Canadian nickel, wasn't it? Um, how did it? How did you? How did it? How did it actually produce the gold color? I mean, you gave us the secret recipe, but I didn't quite hear about how the color is actually formed. Although, of course, it's not gold. Well, I mean, presumably the calcium polysulfide is made in that is made in that uh, brew he made, and he just painted it on. I think, as far as I as far as I recall, he just painted it on. Whether he then had to heat it or not, I don't know. So are you saying, John... The short answer is I'm not really sure. I see. Okay. So you just painted it on. It wasn't part of the... Um, it wasn't produced I by the magical mixture. So I'm a bit confused. No, I think... I think he painted... Well, I think he painted it onto the coin. Whether he then had to bake the coin or not, I don't know. Um, it'll be in his book, but I can't remember. Uh, I, I would rec I would uh, while we're saying that, I mean, if anyone wants to sort of follow this up, Kim Kippy wrote the next. Would it, go on, would it would it be some kind of metallic sulfide like pyrite? Would he have sort of created a kind of surface pyrite? That would seem to me to be. Surface, it was a surface sulfide, yes. It was surface calcium yeah. polysulfide. That's what that's what uh, it's reckoned to be. Um, and that's okay. all I know. Okay, okay. Well, um, okay, let's leave it at that. I dare say somebody could probably, if anybody's interested, they can try and Google it, I guess. Yeah, I'll, I'll refer to Frank Hippie's book. It's called The Secrets of Alchemy, uh, and I can okay. recommend that book. It's in Pishippi, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Secrets of Alchemy, it's called. It was written a while ago now. Well, I've got it here. It was written in 2013. Okay. Published. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much again, John. Uh, we're getting a bit short of time now. People want to get on, I suppose. Uh, thank you again for such a wonderful talk. Wonderful, interesting subject. And just to say to everybody, next week, we're having Diane Elise back again, and this time she's going to talk about another ICI-related topic, Sir John and Henry Bruner, who were, of course, the, Sir John Bruner was the Bruner of Bruner Mon, which in 1926 became the most important part of ICI. So she's right up there in the northwest of England, and she's going to be talking to us about Sir John Bruner and his brother Henry Bruner, and we're really looking forward to that. And I hope you're enjoying all our talk, which will be continuing at least up to the summer. So for now, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, John, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>